That makes sense. Excellent. So, two big things, fairness and reciprocity, and there are other emotions that go into negotiations. All right, so it's more than a rational process. Fair enough? Great. So, let's move on. Manage your emotions to seek understanding of the other's emotions is the first takeaway from this exercise. You have to think about your emotions, like this is not fair, and you have to think about their emotions. Like, why would they offer me one dollar? That's not fair. What's their emotion about this? Hey, you're walking away with a dollar. Two minutes. Came up with nothing, got a dollar. That's a good deal. Okay? So you have to think about those things. So one of the things I want you to think about when you negotiate is try to understand the other side's emotions. And I don't mean like, how are you feeling today about this? I mean just think about how they're thinking about the negotiation process. Okay? We'll come back to this in a little bit. All right. One of the things we have to understand, and this is a basic thing about any negotiation, is there has to be a conversation about something. So I'm selling a tennis racket. How much can you offer me? $50. $50. What if I said it's $480? $50? So we don't have a deal? We don't have a conversation? Nothing to discuss? You're not going to say, how about $190? $190. $190. I'm just going to let you into that, right? Yeah, $190. Do we have a conversation? All right, we don't have a conversation. <laughs> so we have to understand there's always a zone of conversation. If you are negotiating, it is assumed that both parties have a zone of space that we're going to talk about. Otherwise, we have no conversation. Okay, so you're buying a Jeep. How many of you like that Jeep? How many of you don't like Jeeps? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for now, I seem to like Jeeps. All right, just for now. Pretty typical, how many of you have purchased a car in your life? How many of you purchased a car from a dealer? How many of you purchased from a neighbor or a stranger? Fair enough. Very good. So, here's what we're thinking. Gee, 37, 30,000 miles and 700. Seller is asking $21,500. Awesome. Market value, you've done your research. Like all of us do, right? Kelly Bowes, Car Guru. Yeah, is that, if it's really bad condition or good condition, they call it, quote unquote, 16 trees, the average. And if it's in excellent condition, nice stereo, no dings, well polished up, it's 25. I'm going to guess in your head right now you've got a number. What's your number? What's your number? $16,300. What's your number? Troy, what's your number? 18, what's your number? 17, number? 19, 20. That's the number you, that your target is, right? That's the number you want. Are you going to get that number? Maybe, maybe not. What's the max you'll pay? Let's say you say $22,000. Grandma gave you some money. Awesome. What's the match you're going to pay for that car? 21.5? <laughs> is that what they're asking? How many say my max is less than 21.5? What's the number? 20,000. 20,000. Same. Same, 20,000. Very good. Excellent. All right. So here's what we have to understand. We have in our head automatically when we negotiate kind of the max situation. Max price, max, max scenario, whatever it might be. Right? And then we have kind of, this is what we call our walkaway price. I'm going to walk away from this deal if it doesn't happen below this number. It's not within my zone. I'm walking away. Fair enough? All right, well, we have our target price. 17, 18, 16, whatever it is. But how many of you plan in your head when you negotiate for things like a Jeep, what do you do if there's no deal? How many of you plan in advance what your no deal situation is going to be? What's your no deal situation? Go to another dealer. Go to another dealer. Same thing, another dealer. Any other scenarios? Yep. Sorry? Wait for them to come back at a lower price. You just spoke to something interesting about emotions. Time. Time and silence are factors that people use to affect your emotion. Time. It's silence. 
So let's say you make me an offer, and I just look at you. Make me an offer. 19. 19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't say no. I didn't say yes. Do you feel the emotions? Yeah. You feel the emotions because it's silent. Right? Sorry, but good night, I thank you, Sherry. Alright. You feel the emotions. Right? Time is another one. How many of you have been to a car dealer where you spent four hours in a car dealer to buy a car? It was a used car. Why? Why four hours? Okay, you're fine. Alright, so you go back and forth and spend some time, right? Do you know car dealers will use time? as a tool, as a technique for you to buy something? Why? Some cost. Some cost. I've been there for two hours, it was a thousand dollars. Right? I've been there for three hours, it was fifteen hundred dollars. Okay, see how it plays into the emotions? Okay, fair enough. But one of the things I want you to focus on, and forget about the keys or anything else, when you negotiate, you should have in your head a plan for what if this deal does not work? What if you get a job offer and you can't come to an agreement? What's your plan? You have to think about that because that's an important part of negotiation. So, let's say for the fun, that was your target, that was your aspiration, that was your max price. What's your no, what's your no deal situation? Go to another dealership, walk, share a car, borrow a car, whatever you might want to do. All right, now let's raise the stakes. Job offer, it's made, you're graduating. You only have one job offer. And the conversation's not going so well. What is your best alternative to no deal? Come on, be creative. Grad school. Grad school, excellent. That's always a good I started grad school, I didn't want to leave. What else could you do? That's it? You can take the job? Start your own business. Excellent. Many of you are probably thinking about those things, right? What else can you do? You need a place to live. Where can you go live? <laughs> oh, man, not my man's house. <laughs> That's a bad best alternative to come here. I'll take anything but that one, right? All right, or live with a friend. Or work somewhere else part time. Or go to grad school. Or just wait, right? Use all your savings. The point is, do you have a plan if there's no deal? And here's why this is important. Because it is human nature, going back to emotions, it is human nature to want to close the deal. Once we start a negotiation, we want to close the deal. So I teach a class on negotiations. We do a bunch of exercises. Here's what I see every time. I tell the class, you got 30 minutes to negotiate. Most of them finish up. Not everyone, they're still negotiating. I tell them they got one minute left. I always remind them, they don't have to have a deal. What do I almost always get? A deal. Why? The emotion is there's so much pressure to close a deal. Because we spend time, some cost, into negotiation that we don't want to walk away without anything. But if you plan for, I don't have a good deal here, I need to have an alternative for no deal, then you are in a better position. But you've got to plan for it. Does that make sense? Okay, excellent. So, my bad news, my current car runs, it's valued 7500 bucks, it needs some brakes and tires. Yeah, it, it works. It gets me there most days. Okay, so let's talk about planning then. You want to plan for your negotiation. Let's use job offer. Because I guess that's probably something you're all thinking about either now or in the near future. Job offer somewhere, just starting, whatever it might be. Maybe you have a job offer and you got a job. Awesome. New grant, May 2020, Big Net Company, Chicago, starting day is June 6th. Salary is 91000 with benefits. Is that good or bad? Do you like that number? Yeah. You take the job? Yeah. Okay. You get to work 120 hours a week. Take the job? Uh, yeah, maybe. Okay, fair enough. Right. Whatever your major is, that's what you're going to get. Alright. So that's what we have on the table. Right? Let me ask you a question. What do you want? That's what I'm giving you. That's what I've said to you. What do you want? We're going to buy, I'm the HR person, you're the new hire for this big company. What do you want? 
A lot of vacation, how much is a lot? Yeah, standard two weeks. Two and a half weeks of vacation. Okay, what else do you want? Sani bonus. How much do you want for Sani bonus? 35% of my salary? All right, I can't do that math that fast. 35% of 90,000. All right, I'll let you do that math. All right, what else do you want? Relocation. Relocation money. What else do you want? Lesser working hours. Sorry? Lesser working hours. Less working hours. Okay, what else do you want? All right, let's talk about your benefits. You know benefits across companies that are about 35 to 45% of your salary? Retirement. How much retirement do you want for them to contribute? Standard, maybe five to six percent. If you contribute five or six, is that what you want? Okay. What about the start date? How many of you are happy with the start date? June six. No, why not? It's way early. It's way early. What date do you want? September something. Okay, excellent. So here's my point about this, what I'm actually need to do. I want you to think about all the things you want and make a list. And then you have to prioritize those things. Because you're going to find when you're talking to me, the HR person, or me, the future boss, some of those things are easy to give. Now remember, if I give it to you, what am I going to expect from an emotional perspective? Reciprocity. Right? Vice versa. If you give me something I'm wanting, then there's a reciprocity. Back. So, you gotta think about those things. So, how will you plan to negotiate? I'm the HR person, I give you a call, told you that information, what do you tell me? That I have offers from other companies and I'll be out of my way to get them if I don't get. Alright, other offers. That's something you want to tell me in your planning process. Why that? Because it puts pressure on me, right? Okay, what else are you doing in your planning process? Would you rather have a signing bonus, a bigger signing bonus, or a 2% higher salary? Signing bonus. Signing bonus, you said salary, 2% more. How about a five weeks vacation instead of two? Is that more important than a salary? Yes. <laughs> all right, you got to prioritize all of these things. you got to decide what's going to be important to you. But here's what you have to understand. I've done the same thing in my side. So what could you do to help me so I can help you? That's how you've got to think about this. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, you define the interest. <clears throat> Why are you together and why are you negotiating? What is the interest that the company has? Right? What interest do you have? I just asked you to list them. What's the relationship? This is one that we forget about. So if you are negotiating with a future's boss, is that different than negotiating with a corporate HR person? Yes, it is, because the boss is your future relationship that's a little bit stronger. You're buying a car from your aunt. Does that affect your negotiation versus you're buying a car from a neighbor or someone down the street? Yes, because the relationship comes into play. Go back to what we said at the front end. It affects the emotions. I don't want to make my boss mad, so I can't say no to the offer. Well, again, what are their interests? What are your interests? How can you marry those two things together? Okay? So then you got to find what those interests are. And the priorities which we just discussed. That's your second step. Third thing. How do you three things? about negotiation of interest. Here are three things I want you to think about when you think about negotiating interest. There are three types. One is integrated. Maybe the start date is not that important to me, but it's kind of important, but it's really important to you. Great, so we vary on how important it is. Okay. Second thing, maybe we both agree on the same thing. Start date, June 6th is perfect for me. It's perfect for me. What about the things that are not Couple said it. Salary, signing bonus. I gotta manage money. I gotta figure out. I gotta hire a bunch of new hires. I don't want to pay big dollars, but I want to pay enough dollars. Right? That's inverse. 
So here's what your exercise is when you negotiate. You got to figure out which ones are which for the other side for you. So let's do a quick exercise here. Going back to this. I want you to think about this. Start dates, moving expenses, benefits, complimentary ones, salary, signing, all those things. I'm the HR person. How are you going to find out which matters to me? In other words, you've got to help me make it easy for you. But you can't do that unless you understand what I want. How are you going to figure out what I want? Because some of these things we're going to be in agreement on, some of these things we're not going to be in agreement on. How are you going to do that? Yes, please. If they've already given you like a decent start date or some moving expenses, they probably value it. Some of those people assume that it's integrated and supporting you as well. So you want to assume that if they give me this information, they've already kind of valued it because they gave me that particular information, right? So, what about location? We've got offices in Denver, Chicago, St. Louis, LA, uh, New York. How many of you want to live in New York? Awesome. How many of you want to live in Denver? How about San Francisco? LA? Alright, Chicago. Now, do you know because I gave you an offer for Chicago's office that that's a value to me? Maybe. Maybe I'm hiring 20 people and I gotta find 20 different people because you're from Illinois. I'm assuming you want to go to Chicago. How are you gonna find out this is important to me? Is it important that I start in Chicago? So I'm asking that question. Is it important that I start in Chicago? Is it important to start in Chicago? Well, you know what? I've got to fill 10 slots, a couple of them in Denver, a couple of them in uh, LA, a couple of them in San Francisco. I just assume because you're coming from the University of Illinois, you want to be in Chicago. I just gave you information, didn't I? Now, you can use that information for what kind of deal you want from me. Or I say, it is so important that we have someone in Chicago, it's my first priority. Can you use that information in your negotiation with me? You bet. Tell you what, well, you know what, Chicago's not my first choice. I could probably do it. Here's the ask. Reciprocity. But I'm going to need a bigger signing bonus. Because Chicago's kind of expensive living. Well, we won't talk about San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the idea. Okay. So, so third thing which we talked about, you have to establish what your uh, bet is. What happens if this deal doesn't go? What strategy do you have in place? The more and the stronger your bat is, the stronger your negotiation position will be. I've got six offers. They're all great offers. Guess what? I've got a really strong bat now. I've got no offers. I've got a weak bat now. Okay? Or I'm going to the mountain debt. Which may not be a bad thing. So, you got to find your walkway point. So you get sucked into a long conversation and deviate from that. You define what you want and you have to build a relationship with that party. Yes, if it's your boss, you want a relationship, but you also want to build a relationship with the person you're negotiating with. Why? Circle back. The more I like you, the easier it is for me to say yes to you because of the emotions. The more I dislike you, the less easy it is for me to say yes to what you might want. Okay? That's my emotional side. All right. So, a couple key behaviors. Do your homework and plan. Seek to understand what they want. Key here is ask. Two kinds of questions you should ask in all negotiations. How and why? How does that work? How did you decide that 91000 is the right salary for me? Why would you ask that question? Well, I tell you, that's the average. Okay, well, am I better than average? I think I am. Here's why I think I'm better than average. I did this incredible internship. I got great grades. I come from the University of Illinois. I think I'm a little bit better than average. I'm really thinking I would be better off if I got a salary offer closer to this number to this number. See how you're asking the questions gives you information. If you get information, you can help position what you're going to ask for to help them and help you. Make sense? 
All right. So two strategies we think about negotiations. Most of the time we think about it as a competition. I want you to shift your mind. I want you to think of it as this, a mutual problem solving. You have something of interest, I have something of interest. Let's sit down and talk about how we can make this all work between the two of us. Now sometimes you're just going to be just simple competitive. The only thing you're going to argue about is price. I'm buying a car. That's the only price I can get. How much do you sell for? That's going to be competitive. There's not much else you can negotiate about. But if I understand all of your interests, all of them, I can help position what I'm going to want to satisfy your needs and satisfy my needs. So think about it from that perspective. All right, so how do you create value? Ask questions, lots of them. How and why are the best questions you could ask? Share more. Give lots of information about why this is important to you. Because maybe they can help you figure out a solution. All right, maybe you're starting at 6 and you've got a wedding on June 30th. I'll tell you what, will we pay for your flight back and forth from the wedding in San Francisco? Will that make it easy for you to start on the 6th? Okay, not bad. Okay, and then create more options. So, start by creating value. That's where you want to start. So let's do your first offer. One more, a couple more things about first offers. HR director says, about 93000 what's your offer, your counter offer? Let's say you want more money than that because you think you're well deserved of more money than that. What's your counter offer? About 93000 what's your counter offer? 120. Awesome. Why 120? I, I, I definitely value myself, but like I'm setting a number that's like I, I know I'm not going to get that number. So okay. Like, so you're setting a high number, so you know you're not going to be in it, right? Hold that thought. What did the director said? 93, 357 is the average. Now what number are you going to give me? What's the difference between these two things besides 300 dollars and 57? Huh? What? Oh, uh, okay, this is slightly really lower than the average, right? Okay, that's part one. The other part is, the more specific the number is, here's what happens. It's called the anchoring effect. Negotiations are always around the first number. So we're going to negotiate around the number I gave you, more or less, right? Negotiations are always around the first number. In other words, it gives the reference point for the conversation. So, do you want to make the first offer, or do you want them to make the first offer? Think about it for a second, hold that thought. Should you highball it? Right, real big number. 93 is the number, but they're going to say 180. <laughs> because I just told you about anchoring, right? First number is what you negotiate from. What's the problem with that? Go back to what we said at the beginning. Emotions. How would I feel if you gave me a number that was twice the number I gave you? I would not be happy, would I? If I'm not happy with you, I wouldn't have much of a conversation. Not as much of a conversation, right? High volume does not work because of the emotions. So you've got to have a number that's within reason. Or you shouldn't be having a conversation at all. So, should you make the first salary offer? I told you about anchoring. Yes or no? Probably not. Here's why. You should control the first offer if you have all the information. HR has all the information, but you do not. They know what the average has been, they know what the time has been. They have that information, you don't have it. You can do all the research you want, but they're not going to have as much information as they have for this particular job or this particular whatever you're selling or buying. Okay? But if you have more information, then yes, you should make the first offer. Make sense? All right. So, here are the four things I want you to walk out the door with. Manage your emotions. Seek to understand their emotions. Think about what they're experiencing. Help them experience it in a positive way. Do your homework and plan. Build a useful batna, because the stronger the batna is, I've got six job offers. I'm in a good position. I've got no job offers. I'm in a bad position. But I can go with mom and dad. Yeah, that's not so bad. Mom's a great cook. <laughs> Ask questions. Of all the things I've talked about, the thing I want you to remember the most is ask how and why questions. Ask open-ended questions because they give you information. The more information you have, the better you can package the offer. Make sense? 
And then it's kind of creating a mindset of let's see if we can work together and problem solve, not as a competition. Those are the four takeaways from this presentation. All right. Remember, negotiation is more than a rational process. What questions do you have about anything related to negotiations? About job negotiations. That's usually the most common one. What questions do you have? Yes, sir. Um, so, I mean, this isn't something that's happened before, but like, let's just say that like you um, ask a certain question that touches uh, the, the, another company's like tickles them in a different, in a not good way, and then they start like communicating in like a like a not as well fashion. Right. So the question is, uh, the comment is related to a question you're asking, which is, what if I ask a question that's kind of ticks them off the wrong way, right? It makes them upset. Remember, it's about emotions. Are there good ways to ask questions? Yeah. Here's a great way to ask a question. Help me understand. Fill in the blank. Help me understand how you got to $93,000 as the offer. They give you an explanation. Now you have information. Well, that's the average. Okay? I think I'm a little bit better than average, and here's why I think I'm better than average. I would actually prefer something between this number and this number. See how I made that conversation happen in a positive, helpful way. So it's how you ask the questions going to be important. As long as you ask professionally and politely, then that's going to be effective. Now, they can always not give you the information. Here's another question people ask when they're hiring sometimes, not generally at, at your level of hire, but sometimes before they start the offer process, they say, what number are you looking for? You get that a lot when you're buying a car. What number are you looking for? If you have all the information and you know how good and how much value you have on the marketplace, then you give them a number. I'm going to guess your first, second job, you don't have that number. But if you're a CEO and the people are recruiting you all the time and making you offers all the time, you've got a number. So the key here is, why do you ask? Help me understand why this is important. Like I'm looking for a good job, I'm looking for a good salary, start explaining why you think you're good for the job. Could you tell me what you think would be a good number for you? See how I've changed the conversation? But the reason they're asking is because they, they may get a low number from, from you. Right? Let's say their average is 93, but you say, you know what, 87 would be awesome. Guess what? Okay. I'll give you 87. The money on the table, as they say. That makes sense. Great question. Another question we've got about two minutes. Um, if you have two companies, like an offer from two companies, and you're talking about say like a way higher signing bonus from the other, would you like vaguely allude to the fact that you had a way higher signing bonus offer from the other, or would you tell them like exactly what you had like how you can that? Right, so is that information helpful in your negotiations to tell them? Potentially, because they might feel like they have a match. Alright, so they have to understand who you are and what your value is, right? So it's always good to share more information than to share less. Here's another one that students get hung up on. I've got a deadline from another company about my offer. All right, my offer explodes in two weeks. And I just got an offer from another company B. Should I tell them they have a deadline? How do you say yes, tell them you have a deadline? Yes, tell them a deadline. Why? Because they know the parameters that you're working from. They know they've got about two weeks to let you know. Now maybe they come back to you and say, you know, we can't do that that fast. Could you mind calling the other company and see if you can get a little lead? Wait, sure, I can do that. Go back to emotions. What have I just done? Create a reciprocity. I can do that. I'll go to the other company, see if I can get an extra week or two, give you a little bit more time to figure out what the deal is going to be, because I really like your company to begin with. Does that make sense? All right. Great question. Yes, one more question. So for people that are entry level and haven't had experience with negotiations like this, what's a good thing to make sure you're not being taken advantage of? How to make sure you're not being taken advantage of? Two things. Do your homework. Do as much research as you can in a number of different ways to find out what the average salary is for that job in that location. Obviously, you can go to career services. They can give you tons of information about what companies are paying here at Illinois for these kinds of jobs. You get the average of the range and all that. That's part one. Part two is ask questions. If they give you a number and say it's 93000 you can ask a good question. That's the average. What's the range for a new hire straight out of college? Well, we're between 92 and 95. Great. Help me understand why 95, someone gets 95 someone gets 92. What's the 95 that's different about them? 
Well, they have five years' experience. Uh, I don't have that. Or I do. See how by learning what they have, you can help build the argument for why you fit for that number. Does that make sense? Great question. All right, I don't want to hold you up from your, uh, your um, I guess your jobs. <laughs> uh, so let me just say thank you. I appreciate your patience on this one. And uh, we went very fast, so I'll be glad to ask any questions, answer any questions. Feel free always to just shoot me an email if you have questions. Uh, and thanks for playing along. Give yourselves a hand.